Well, good morning, everyone. All of you that are here this morning, we're glad that you're here, and we're glad that you've joined us on Um, seek to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, hear from his word. Let's pray together, and then Pete will come up with some announcements, and, uh, and we'll get started. Our Father, we want to thank you for this day. In eternity past, Lord, we can't even imagine the thought that you knew we would be here today. All of us gathered together, and you knew all the details of what's going on in the world today. And Lord, we're just so thankful that we can always trust in you and that we can rest in you and that we need not fear uh, those things that are going on all around us in the world. But Father, we are secure and safe in the arms of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's because of his work of redemption at the cross that we are here. He has forgiven our sin and promised us the the hope of eternal life. And Father, we, uh, we realize that in these earthly lives that we have now. Uh, This is only a a temporary place for us. And uh, Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God would minister to each one of us and that you would speak to us through your word so that we can know how to live in these uh, tumultuous times. Father, we come to you and ask that you would fill us with your spirit and fill us with your peace and with your hope and your love. Fill us with your word. Father, we come to you giving you thanks and praise and praying that you would use our time together this morning for the, for the building up of the saints and, uh, and, Lord, for the proclamation of the gospel in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we commit our morning to you as we would give you thanks for it. And we ask this all together, praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Pete. Morning, church. Morning. 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 It's good to see some... Uh faces out there, that's good, you know, not everybody's uh, run away, uh, got a tropical storm out there, now this is interesting, um, I think the pronunciation of this tropical storm that I've been hearing in the media is Isiaia, Isiaia, right, and yet in the King James, that's what Isaiah is, in the old King James, if you look in the earlier versions of old King James. That's how it's spelled. So I'm going to say Isaiah, if hopefully nobody gets offended by that. Okay. Isaiah remains, uh, this, is a, this is a report from 5.30 a.m. I'm sorry, I don't have anything earlier than that, uh, or later than that. Um, Isaiah remains a tropical storm overnight, currently sustained winds of 65 miles an hour. Uh, currently is sitting 45 miles off the coast of Fort Lauderdale and is moving northwest at 9 miles per hour, expecting the storm to turn to north, northeast Monday morning. So uh, even though that's a, that sounds like a good report and it sounds like, you know, we're going to kind of miss that, uh, I do want to warn everybody that, you know, you know, the, you guys know the, the drill here in uh, living in Florida and how these tropical storms sometimes have a mind of their own and they just turn around and say, okay, yeah, there's nothing to worry about. Don't look at me anymore. And then all of a sudden we got a, you know, a hurricane raging off the coast and it decides to take a, a slam due west, you know, and hit us, you know, so... We've seen that happen. We've seen where storms do these loopy loop things and then they just turn around and they, they just have a mind of their own. So you guys know the drill. We've, we've all been through it. So uh, uh, just, you know, you want to make sure you take the proper precautions and don't wait to the last minute, you know? That's why those spaghetti models have all those. And that's why they call them spaghetti models, paths. right? Yeah, <laughs> because they're all over the place, right? So anyway uh tuesdays uh we're still planning on doing the men's discipling men so that's going to be at 7 p.m here in the sanctuary guys uh wednesday again a joint pastor on uh, studying proverbs and i didn't catch the one last week but i do want to look at that one on integrity that's last that was last wednesday that's what i said yeah last week (laughs) so i do want to check that out and uh yeah i do uh proverbs is just chock full of really good stuff so um Definitely want to see that study. Um, And also just a reminder of folks that if you're looking for additional sermons and other things, uh, you know, other studies that we have done in the past, uh, you can check out Facebook page or Lakeland Bible Church Facebook page. If you click on the video tab or a little button on the side there uh, in the navigation pane uh, and click on videos, It'll come up with, uh, you'll see playlists that are set up and and where the playlists are organized where uh, 
specific studies in the various books like you know first john and you know and proverbs and so on and so forth so it's all we're trying to keep it organized that way so if you're like doing a particular study in one particular book uh you, you know do check that out uh we also of course have our videos on on facebook uh, i'm sorry on uh, youtube and uh one other thing check out the new website our new website has been posted and yes you can check out those videos through the website as well uh, reminder on tithing, um, if you choose to uh, send in your tithes and, yeah, and you're not here personally, you can mail it uh, to Lakeland Bible Church, P.O. Box 7212, Lakeland, Florida 33807. Um, and I was just made aware that we are... You didn't have to tell everybody that. Well, I, I, it's only that I've been using the <laughs> announcement bad. saying that we turned off cash apps and then an uncle pastor tells me, no, well, we still have it. Like, okay, great. I've been false, falsely saying easy announcement here. Wow. So apparently Cash App is still available. So if you're still accustomed to using Cash App, uh, you can use the Cash App. Uh, just make sure that you are sending it to the church phone. So it's important that you get this church number right. 863-209-2280. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So we didn't have any birthdays. Uh, any birthday announcements, but we do have an anniversary, so we do want to shout out uh, for Robert and Suzanne. Their anniversary is on uh, August 6th, coming up, so that's a good thing. So that brings us into the National Day of. And today is National Coloring Book Day. National Color Coloring Book Day. My wife and granddaughters will love that. No? I got nothing. <laughs> I got no reaction from you guys. All right, so recognizes the joy children and adults alike derive in coloring pages and designs. I guess there's some sort of therapeutic thing going on there. So uh, maybe this one will get a little bit better reaction. National Ice Cream Sandwich Day. All right, all right, we got some good. Uh, hey, all right, good, all right, all right, we got some reaction here. <laughs> all right, so the original ice cream sandwich sold for a penny in 1900 from a push cart in the Dowry or Bowery neighborhood of New York. Uh, they didn't actually, they couldn't identify, or there wasn't any write up of who actually invented it. It was just some vendor. And they didn't, they actually didn't have his name documented. So ice cream sandwich was, uh, was placed, or the ice cream was placed between two milk biscuits. And that's how it was sold, for a penny. Hmm. Um, it was only until 1945 that Jerry Newberg has been credited of using the chocolate waf wafers of what we see as the ice cream sandwich of today. So a little history there. Um, also, uh, for every first Sunday in August, we have these other ones that are recognized. The American Family Day. It's the day it encourages families to spend time with one another. It's also the National Friendship Day, which encourages people across the country and the world to connect with friends. And then social media does a nice job of doing that, you know. Um, helping us out with that. It's also National Sisters Day, and it celebrates the unique bond between sisters. Um, this particular set of siblings embrace the moments that make them laugh and cringe while they don't always agree. Sisters always have each other's back. And that's all I have. So I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor. Well, my wife will love the whole idea of National Coloring Book Day because my wife and granddaughter spend a good deal of time coloring books. And it's not only therapeutic, it also is usually pretty effective in keeping the kids quiet, too. So it's a, it's a good thing. Well, we want to look at the Word this morning, and uh, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2. Let's pray together, and we'll get started, all right? Our Father, again, we, we want to hear from heaven. We want to hear a word from our loving Heavenly Father. And so, Lord, I pray that our hearts may be open, that you might uh, be able to speak through your servant, and that we would hear the voice of God and, and not the opinions and thoughts of men. And so, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us now as we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 2. And we're going to be talking about the primacy of preaching. We value things that are first. We love being first in line. 
We uh, love winning first place. We like to be the first one to do something. Uh, Tim and Amanda are looking forward to their soon coming firstborn son uh, next week. So if you think about them, pray. Noah should be here on the 6th. That's his projected due date. Uh, firstborn children are, are always special. Um, they're not better, uh, but they are special. Of course, in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was better because the Bible says he is the firstborn from the dead, and he's a whole lot better than any of us. But uh, being firstborn child is, is something special. We always remember the first time that we did something, and that's always special. So being first have, has a special significance for us. The book of Acts is a book of first. In this book, you will find out about the first Christians, the first church, the first preaching of the gospel, the first missionaries, the, uh, the first time believers were called Christians, the first Gentile believers, the, uh, the first church council, the first Christian martyr, and, and several other firsts that you will find as you make your way through this book. And this book of Acts is really just a record of our heritage. As Christians, it tells us how we got our start as followers of Jesus Christ. And so for those of us who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, it would be very beneficial for us to, to know what we can, to, to learn what we can find out about them as this church began. And uh, we began our studies in Acts on the day of Pentecost. That was back in uh, May 31st. And we looked at the coming of the Holy Spirit. We saw how the church was born on that day. And, uh, and then from there we jumped back to chapter 1 and, of course, chapter 24 of Luke. And we began to put that all together to see how uh, this divinely inspired historical account of the acts of the Holy Spirit working through the disciples and the first believers in the church. And it is the record of the works that Jesus continued to do. He was working, and so uh, at the, the work of the cross is finished, but he was still working, and then he worked up until the time he ascended up into heaven, but now he's there, and he's still working because he is working through his church. He sent the Holy Spirit to, uh, to indwell us, and so the Lord Jesus Christ said that he would uh, come into us, and he would continue to build his church through us today. So... We're going to skip over the arrival of the Spirit since we already covered that back at Pentecost. And what I want to do is jump over that and look at what happened right after Pentecost came. Right after the coming of the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bibles, look in Acts chapter 2. And here you see two responses of what actually happened. They heard the, the sound of a mighty rushing wind. They saw cloven tongues as a fire. They, uh, they began to speak in other tongues, which are other languages. And it says that everybody heard the marvelous works of God in their own language. So this was a unique event in church history. And, and so there were participants that were there, and they were involved in what was happening. And yet there was a large crowd there, and uh, they were witnesses to what happened, but they were wondering what happened. And so we find this in chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. It says that they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said they are full of new wine. Now, you know, anytime God does something, you're going to have those who believe that God is doing a work there. But there will always be those who reject that it's a work of God. They will mock it and they will make fun of it. And just like the enemies of the Lord, they concluded that the works of Jesus were actually the work of the devil. And there were those who scoffed at the idea that what they were seeing happen here at Pentecost was, uh, was something that they didn't understand, but it was something that they mocked. They could not see that it was God at work. And what they did was they did just basically accuse these people. They said, you're all drunk. You're, uh, and it's nine o'clock in the morning. So, uh, so that was their, you know, that was their take on what they saw happening. Hey, you guys are all drunk. What's going on here? 
And uh, one of the things that you and I need to be aware of is that the world we live in wants absolutely nothing to do with our Jesus or with our Christian faith. When you want to get serious about following the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to know that you're going to face some op opposition, you're going to face some ridicule, and eventually you will face persecution in some measure. Right now, it's not all that severe here. But there are places in the world where it is very costly to be a follower of Christ. And that you will suffer pers persecution. But we are beginning to see that that is escalating here in this country. Uh, we've got several local governments that are trying to shut down churches and they're using the pandemic as their excuse. Um, we're accused of being religious bigots who want to control and conform. You see, as you look at social media, you see all kinds of anti-Christian sentiments and, uh, and criticisms of the church, mocking Christians. Um, and we see examples today where we're either being forced to display our loyalty for the Lord Jesus Christ or bow to the pressure of the culture uh, in professional sports right now. Uh, there are two that stand out to me right now, Sam Coonrod with the San Francisco Giants and Jonathan Isaac who plays for the, uh, for the uh, Orlando Magic. And the rest of their athletic world is bowing down to the pressure and bowing down for the national anthem and bowing to the Black Lives Matter agenda. But these two individuals, and probably there's some more I'm sure, they chose to stand and not bow to the pressure. And so they're taking a stand and, and their reason for standing is because the Black Lives Matter movement holds to some beliefs that are unbiblical. And it's their biblical conviction that they need to stand for Christ. And so that's why they did not bow. The time is coming where we're going to have to make that choice too. Were you going to follow Jesus and show your loyalty to him? Or are you going to yield to the pressure to conform? And uh, we're not far from that right now. Paul told Timothy, he said that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus himself said, you know, if they persecuted me, they're certainly going to persecute you. So those things are coming. Now this is just a side note. I'm no prophet, but the evidence seems pretty clear that it is beginning to escalate. Our culture is rapidly decaying, both morally and spiritually. And there's this growing movement to take down anyone who does not bow to their godless agenda. We're not there yet, but it's, it's growing, it's coming. And so we're going to have to make a choice whether we want to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ or give in to the pressure. So be ready. Just a, a word of warning. Now back to our text. Pentecost has happened, the Holy Spirit's come, and now God has everybody's attention. Everybody's wondering what's happened here. What's going on? And so now God is going to raise up Peter as his spokesman. And he's going he's to take control of the situation and he's going to stand up and give an explanation and preach a sermon about what is going on and why is it happening. And, uh, and so God uses Peter as his mouthpiece. You know, it's interesting that as you look through the Gospels and if you look through the book of Acts, you see that Peter liked to be first. Uh, he, was, uh, he was the first of the apostles. He was actually the first apostle that stuck his foot in his mouth. Of course, he didn't do that just one time. He did that on several occasions. He was the first to get out of the boat. He was the first to uh, grab a sword when they came to arrest the Lord Jesus. And he was the first to deny the Lord Jesus. So not all of his firsts were actually commendable. But now Pentecost has taken place. The church has been born. The Holy Spirit has indwelt them and filling them. And now he becomes the first evangelist. He becomes the first pastor of the first church. And for the very first time, he gets up, and now he has the dubious distinction 
of preaching the very first sermon in the church. And, and so this morning, before we actually talk about his sermon, we'll look at that next week or the week after. But what I want to talk to you this morning is about the primacy of preaching. What is, this, what is the significance of preaching being the first thing, the first activity in the church after it was born? Why is that important? So I want to look, first of all, at the priority of preaching. I find it very telling that the very first activity after the church is born is preaching. In churches today, most of you probably know that they will play down the the place of preaching in the church. They want to focus more on programs and activities and culturally relevant talks and discussions with, uh, with, of course, exciting worship and drama. Now, these things aren't necessarily wrong. In fact, some of them have very important roles in the church's ministry. But what has too often been sacrificed amid the activities and the programs is the priority and the primacy of preaching. Now, I understand that it is the most important activity that takes place in the church. Because everything that takes place by way of ministry will flow out of what they hear through the preaching. The content of the message that is declared is going to influence and flavor everything else that happens uh, in the ministry of the church. And that's why it's so important. And if the very first event in church history was Peter's sermon, that should speak volumes to us about how important preaching is. We could go to the Old Testament and we could look at the prophets and we can see how the the priority of preaching uh, played such a role in their lives as servants of the Lord. Of course, we could look at the Lord Jesus Christ and we saw his priority to preach the kingdom. In fact, when he began his ministry, he stood up in the synagogue in Nazareth and he opened the scroll to the book of Isaiah And this is what he read to them. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. You'll notice as I put these verses up here, I've I've underlined every time you find the word preach or proclaim or speak or teach. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so as we go through Acts, we see that preaching has always been central to the church's mission. In chapter 2 it begins. Peter preaches this sermon, and 3,000 people are saved. In chapter 3, he stands up and he preaches another sermon. Another 5,000 are saved. So right right away in two sermons, you've got 8,000 new converts as a result of the preaching of the gospel. Then when you get to chapter 4, it says in verse 2, it says they were greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They didn't want to hear preaching. And they commanded him to stop speaking in his name. The next day they brought Peter and John before them. They said, by what power, what name have you done these things? Because not only did he preach the gospel and all these people responded, he also healed a a lame man there as well in the name of Jesus. Then we get to Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. It says, And daily in the temple, in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus is the Christ. Then you come to chapter 7. A young man named Stephen. He stands up and he preaches the gospel. And the crowd is angered. (laughs) It says they gnashed their teeth at him. They were so angry at what they had heard. And they stoned him to death. And at that point, a big wave of persecution began to come upon the church. And people were being persecuted and people died. He was the first Christian martyr. In Acts chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, it says, Therefore... Those who were scattered, because once the persecution started, everybody scattered. They left Jerusalem and they, they just started going out to the uttermost parts of the earth. 
They went everywhere preaching the word. And then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. When we get to chapter 9, we see this amazing conversion. Well, later on in verse 35, I forgot. Peter opened, or Philip opened his mouth and he began at this scripture preaching. Because he went down, God sent him down and he ran into an Ethiopian eunuch. And he's reading the scroll of Isaiah. And, he, and, and God sends Philip to him and he says, well, who is this speaking of? And it says, so he now started preaching Jesus to him because of what he was reading. When we get to chapter 9, we see this amazing conversion of Saul, the man who was actually responsible for the, for the execution, the stoning of Stephen. And he was on his way to Damascus to persecute more Christians, those what they call followers of the way. And he has this encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is miraculously converted. He's blinded for three days, he goes, he continues on his way to Damascus, and for three days he's blind until God sends a man to him named Ananias. And Ananias restores his sight in Acts chapter 9, verse 20. It says, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So Saul, right now his name is still Saul. It's not been changed to Paul yet, but he goes out, and the first thing he does once his eyes are opened up, he goes out and starts preaching the gospel too. Now, of course, because he was the persecutor of the church, everybody's freaking out. They're all scared to death because they're thinking, you know, this is just a ploy to uh, infiltrate the church so he can persecute more of us. And they were afraid of him. Of course, the Jews who had actually commissioned him to go persecute the church... They're all angry at him now, and they're trying to kill him, and so he has to run from them. And so we find this pattern being established. This is just the first nine chapters of the book of Acts. But this pattern is established in the, in the early part, and it continues on all the way to the very end of the book. Preaching is a priority. Everywhere they went, they preached Christ. He was number one. Why? Because the Lord Jesus told him to. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. When Paul wrote to Timothy, the young pastor of the church at Ephesus, this is what he told him before he was actually executed for preaching the gospel. He says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at the appearing of his kingdom and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Those are all part of the ministry of preaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So the exhortation here is to be faithful to preach the word. Because he says there is a coming time when people aren't going to want to hear it. And I think we're at that time right now, today. There are a lot of preachers out there that are just tickling ears. But the truth is, is that God wants men to hear the truth. He wants us to hear his gospel. He wants us to hear his word. And he raises up men to preach and declare the word of God. Paul makes this clear when he wrote to the church in Rome... In chapter 10, he says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So preaching is actually the means by which God has mandated that his gospel be made known. Preaching the word of God has the supernatural power to transform lives. And hearing the word of God is what 
is what stirs faith in our heart. Faith comes alive through the preaching of the Word of God. Peter would later write in his first epistle, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the, as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flowers fall away, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. So what I'm doing right now is following the mandate of the Lord Jesus Christ and following the example of the early church to come before God's people and declare his word to preach the gospel. Now privately you get with the word of God and when you're reading the word of God that very simply is just God preaching to you. But when we come together corporately for worship, or we come together on mission, then preaching is the means by which God wants to make His will known. Christ is the focal point, and uh, making the will of God known to those who hear is God's desire. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who is known as the Prince of Preachers, he wrote this, We should first and foremost preach Christ and Him crucified. The Christian minister should preach all the truths which cluster around the person and work of Jesus Christ. So preaching is of primary importance. That is to be a priority within the church of Jesus Christ. But I want to understand what preaching is. What is preaching? Because most of us, I think we know, we, you know, we think we know when somebody's preaching to us. We all have our understanding and idea of what it means to preach. But there are two Greek words that help us understand exactly what biblical preaching is, New Testament preaching is. Because truthfully, there's a lot of preaching out there going on that can't really qualify as biblical preaching. So, so what is it? Well, the word... Keruso, that's the verb. It means to proclaim or to herald, to, to declare publicly. It comes from the noun kerub, kerubma, and that refers to the content of what is being preached. Now, John MacArthur notes that Jesus Christ is the focal point. He is the, he is the central theme of all this New Testament preaching, and he identifies five elements of New Testament preaching. And so what are they? These are all things that you, read, that you hear about Christ in biblical preaching. Number one, Jesus is presented as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Secondly, he is identified as God manifested in human flesh. Thirdly, it focuses on his life and work, especially on his death and resurrection. Fourthly, it speaks of his second coming and then number five, it declares that salvation can only come through faith in Him and to reject Him as, the Lord, and, as Lord and Savior is to be eternally damned. And we'll see all of these elements when we get to examine Peter's sermon and all the other sermons that we come across. We will find all five of these elements in these messages that we find. Now, the second word that's used of preaching is the word didache. We get our word didactic. It means teaching or doctrine. It is the instruction that we will get if there is keruso. This is what we receive. Remember, Jesus told Peter, he says, I want you to feed my sheep, Peter. What is it he's supposed to feed him? It's the word of God. That was his commission. To proclaim Christ and his cross. But it also refers to preaching the great truths of all scripture, uh, of the whole of scripture as well. Doctrine is important. And if any preaching is devoid of doctrine, then it really isn't biblical preaching. Now let me just say this, a lot of people will complain and they, they don't like doctrine because they say doctrine divides. And I say, well, yes it does. It is intended to divide. Because when you hear the truth, there are some who are going to believe the truth and some who will reject the truth. 
It, it separates the sheep from the goats, the false from the true. Those who are genuine believers and those who are just claimers and not really converted. Doctrine is supposed to divide. So there's really nothing wrong with that. Now it's believed that Peter's sermon, his first sermon was perhaps the greatest sermon that he ever preached. We don't know, but as far as what's recorded of Peter's sermons, the, certainly the first one was perhaps the greatest because it was a clear proclamation of who Jesus is and what he accomplished on the cross. But it is also a clear, concise explanation teaching God's truth about the work of salvation. What is it that we must do to believe, to, 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 to be saved? Now, we'll review these points again when we get to Peter's sermon, but, but Kent Hughes, in his commentary, he identifies a bunch of characteristics about Peter's sermon. And I think that, that these are things that should apply to any kind of preaching that we hear today. Number one, he says it was simple. He didn't assume that everybody was on the same intellectual level. He was very careful to explain what he was saying, what he was teaching. He didn't use big words to impress people. He made it easy for everybody to understand. J. Vernon McGee, he's with the Lord now, but he was known for his simplicity in teaching. And he used to say this, he says, you put the cookies on the bottom shelf so that the kitties can get to them. You know, and you, you bring the word down. You, you can preach and use big words, and you can be intellectual, but you want to you wanna bring the understanding because the task of the preacher is to help people understand what the word says. Keeping it simple. I hate when I hear preachers use big th theological words without explaining what it means. I particularly hate preachers when they use Latin. I thought that was a dead language. <laughs> but, uh, and, and it's okay if you want to use Latin, but give the meaning. What are you saying? People need to understand. There needs to be a clear message of what's being declared. So biblical preaching needs to be simple. You can still dig into the deep truths, but you just want to help everybody to understand. You don't want to leave people behind. Secondly, it was scriptural. Peter preached the word and frequently quoted, quoted the Old Testament scriptures. Biblical preaching is to declare God's truth. I'm not here to give you my personal opinion. Although there are times when you want to give your opinion, you want to make that clear in my preaching, hey, this is my opinion, this is not what God says. People need to hear the word of God. They need to know what God says. They don't need to know what I think. You need to hear what God has to say. Now it is my personal conviction and opinion that expository preaching is the preferred method. That doesn't mean all the other methods are bad. There are different methods of preaching. But my personal preference is expository preaching. And Haddon Robinson who wrote several textbooks on preaching he gives an explanation of biblical exposition. He says it's the communication of a biblical concept derived from and transmitted through a historical, grammatical, and literary, stu uh, literary study of a passage in its context, which the Holy Spirit first applies to the personality and experience of the preacher. Hear that? Because I get it before you do then through him to the hearers. And so I believe that verse by verse through a book of the Bible is one of the, one, one of the most effective ways of making God's will known. That's why we're making our way through the book of Acts. We've already gone through Romans and Ephesians and First and Second Timothy and we've gone through many, many books in the scriptures, verse by verse. There's nothing wrong with topical preaching. But if that's your preferred style of preaching, you sort of pick and choose what topics you want to deal with. But when you're doing expository preaching, you come to topics that may not be all that comfortable and may not be that pleasant to deal with. 
But when you get to them, you, you, you either show your hand and show that you're a coward <laughs> or you dig into it and try to explain the meaning. That, like I said, that's my personal opinion. Thirdly, it was Christ-centered. Now, we've already said that. And, of course, our motto here is we're all about Jesus. Life is to be all about Jesus. If I try to tell you how you can change your life and how you can live a productive and healthy, emotionally uh, well, experience emotional well-being, and, and I don't tell you that that's got to be linked to Christ and life in Christ, then I'm doing you a disservice. Because as Christians, the, the, the effectiveness of our Christian life is going to be directly related to our relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, I can put on a good show, and I can go through the motions, and I can do a lot of good things, and, and, and be a good person to a lot of people. But if I'm preaching the word, and I'm saying, hey, you can do this, and I'm not linking it to your relationship with Jesus Christ, then I've failed in the ministry of preaching. Because anything that God wants to, to bring about in our lives is going to be directly related to our relationship with Him. The, uh, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, To me who am, the, who, who am less than the least of all the apostles, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Those unsearchable riches of Christ have everything to do with how we live our lives today. Christ is our life. And He is the only one that can change men's hearts. And He is the only hope that this world has. So any message that is devoid of Christ is not biblical preaching. Then it was convicting. God's truth brings us face to face with who we are. It shows us what's wrong with us. It shows us the need for change. Now that word convict means to convince someone of the truth, to reprove, to accuse, to refute, or to cross-examine a witness. When I hear preaching from the Word of God, the Holy Spirit takes His Word and He acts like a prosecuting attorney. And He begins to expose my sin. He begins to reveal my evil and he rebukes me and he convinces me that, that I need Jesus and I need him for salvation and I need him to keep me right before God. He convicts us because he wants us to find the forgiveness and freedom from, from condemnation that can be found only in Christ. I remember when Pastor Arnett, as my pastor, he preached this sermon. And I've said this before because it's it, to me, it just has always stuck with me. He preached at my ordination service. And he said, a good sermon will do three things. He says, first of all, it'll disturb you. Through preaching, God uses his word as a mirror. The Spirit of God reveals your sin and convicts you. And almost every time I hear a good sermon... I am confronted with something in my life that needs to be changed. Just like what you're hearing today, God's going to say something to you that will just, it's like he puts his thumb on this and he says, hey, you need to pay attention here. This is something that applies to you. That's not for me to try to determine. That's for me to let the Holy Spirit, as I declare his word, he takes the entirety of the sermon and he may take one sentence out of the whole sermon and nail you with it because this is what he wants you to work on, to deal with. So it'll disturb you. It's the reason why a lot of people don't want to go to church. Because <laughs> they hear things they don't want to hear. Secondly, it'll direct you. If I respond in repentance and faith, God is going to forgive me and he's going to restore me so that I can now begin to walk in the light as he is in the light. So it's, gonna, it, it, it's like a light that shows the path that I need to take. Then thirdly, as we already mentioned, it'll divide you. 
I can resist the conviction and I can harden my heart. In which case, if I'm a true believer, the conviction is only going to get worse until I repent and get right with the Lord. If I'm not a believer and I don't want to heed what it says, I don't want to respond in faith and repentance, then I'm going to rebel and I'm going to turn away from it. Some of us in our testimonies, we will, I, I will tell you right now, that was a part of my early life before I came to know the Lord. I had people preaching to me that I, just, I cussed them out because I didn't want to hear what they had to say. If I'm not a believer, I'll rebel if I don't want to believe. Then he says it was practical. Peter started off by explaining what was happening as everybody's wondering, what in the world's going on here? A biblical sermon needs to address the issues of life. And so anytime we preach the word of God, it is going to deal with practical matters of living. Then he says it's, was a, it, it was attention getting and relevant. Peter made a point to effectively tie in what was happening with scripture and clearly pointed to Jesus. Now, you know he got their attention when he said this in this sermon. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. Whap! Both Lord and Christ. That got their attention. And that's what truth does. Truth applied to your life will get your attention... And there is nothing more relevant in your life than that. You may not like it. Many of them didn't like it. But at the same time, remember there were 3,000 people that saw the relevance of the gospel and they believed and they were born again. 3,000 people were saved that day. Amazing. But to be attention getting and relevant doesn't mean that you're going to have everybody's attention. Some won't want to hear it. Some will get tired of hearing it. Some will be distracted with their personal problems. Some won't like what they hear. But you see, in biblical preaching, God does not hold the preacher accountable for the way people respond. He holds me accountable for what I declare. He holds you accountable for the response. And it's a shame that, uh, that there are more preachers don't realize the responsibility that they have to preach God's truth. I love this quote by Spurgeon. He says, a time is com will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. And, and, and we can see that. We can turn on the television and see some of these televangelists and preachers, and we see that going on all the time. There are a lot of clowns entertaining the goats, and I, and I don't want to be one of them. I, I'm going to have to stand before God. And that's why James says in chapter 3, he says, Let my, not many of you be teachers, my brethren, knowing that such will incur a stricter judgment. We will give an account for what we preach. Now I have to answer to God for that. So biblical preaching is proclaiming Christ and teaching sound doctrine. So we've seen the priority of preaching. We've seen what biblical preaching is. Now I want to look at the purpose of preaching. First and foremost, biblical preaching is to make Christ known. That is the Holy Spirit's priority. You remember the Lord Jesus Christ said that the Holy Spirit, he says, he, he, he will speak of me, he will glorify me. So the Holy Spirit, when he is in operation, when he is working in our midst, Jesus Christ is going to get all the attention. He's the one who's going to be focused on. 
So the purpose of biblical preaching is to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ. People need to hear the gospel because it is the good news that saves people's souls. Evangelism. That was Peter's first and, and primary purpose as he stood up to preach. You remember earlier in Romans chapter 10 we read, How will they believe if they don't hear and how are they going to hear if no one preaches? Because faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. When the word is preached, people believed, lives were changed. The preaching of the word of God in the gospel specifically mean, is the means through which people come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul explains this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Listen to what he says. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel... Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now here Paul calls this the foolishness of preaching. And I I, I believe that says a lot about the way the world views what we are doing here this morning. They think that what I am having to say is a foolish message, because they don't want to believe it. In their eyes, it's a fool's message, and it's a fool's errand. In the minds of many, the content of preaching and perhaps even the delivery of the sermon is considered foolish. But it is only foolish in the world's eyes. It's not going to make any sense to them unless and until God opens up their heart. We are still to preach because... It is Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. There is power in this message. And power in the word of God. It is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces the soul and, and divides the soul and spirit. And it's a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When the word of God is declared, it, 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 it deals with the human heart issues. That's why Paul would say this in Romans chapter 1. So as much as it is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Regardless of of what people may think, you heard the gospel. And your heart was convicted of your sin. And you savingly believed. You saw the truth of the gospel that was presented. You saw the truth of your human condition. And you realized that there was no hope apart from Christ. The Spirit of God revealed that to you through the preaching of His Word. When their eyes were opened... That began, that was like the first step of belief, of faith. But but now there's much more that needs to be done. Preaching the gospel just opens the eyes and it starts you on that walk of faith. Now, this is where the Great Commission comes in. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. But in Matthew's account, he says, go into all the world and make disciples. Preaching the gospel and seeing people saved, that's the first step. 
Now we need to make disciples. 3,000 people were saved after that first sermon. And from that point on, the preaching in the church had to be a whole lot more involved. And so P, uh, Paul, rather, when he's departing from the church at Ephesus and he's getting ready to go to Rome, he's saying goodbye to the elders and he says, I, I, I did not refrain from, from preaching the whole counsel of God. Jesus Christ was the focal point, but he would bring the entirety of Scripture into play as far as revealing to those hearers what it was that God wants to happen in our lives. Preaching expands to teach the entirety of Scripture until the Lord, while the Lord Jesus, He remains the focal point in our life, discipleship has to begin. Growing in faith, serving the Lord, learning how to love the Lord, Learning what the will of God is. And that's why Paul declares this as he's writing to the church in Colossae. He said to them, In him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working which works in me mightily. That was his objective, and as a pastor and as a preacher, that is my objective. Number one, to preach the gospel and to see people saved. But number two, to see people respond to the word of God, to grow in their relationship with the Lord, so that I can present you before the Lord perfect or mature in Christ Jesus. Paul explains further in Ephesians chapter 4, he talks about gifted individuals that are given to the church. Different roles, but in each one of these roles that he identifies here, while the word preaching or preacher is not identified, the role of, or the task of preaching is part of the responsibility of every one of these. Look what he says here. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. And he gave some, and he, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now these are all people who preach. And he gave them to the church. Why? For the equipping of the saints, that's you, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You guys are to do the work of the ministry. The declaration of the word of God will help you in that endeavor. It equips you. It builds you up. It edifies the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love. That, you could say that that's a pretty simple definition of preaching. Speaking God's truth in love. And we may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And you see, you, you see that we all have a hand in the work of ministry here and the building up of the body. And my preaching is what equips you, it what feeds you, so that you're built up, and when you take the Word of God and you let it get implanted into your heart, you begin to respond in faith and obedience, and you begin to, to, to yield to the Lord and the, and the Lordship of Christ, and you begin to search out what your spiritual gifts are, and you seek ways in which you can manifest those gifts for the building up of the body. So the primacy of preaching means a man is called of God and he takes the stance of a prophet to speak for God. You know, when I stand up here and I preach, I, I, I don't really want you to hear what Pastor Mike has to say. I'm hoping that you come and you listen for preaching because you want to hear what God has to say. Because the preacher is really God's mouthpiece kind of like 
John the Baptist says. He must increase. I must decrease. I want people to hear what God has to say. I want people to see Jesus Christ and not me up here. Because he's the one that changes your life. I am a herald. In the Old Testament sense, and, and all through history, heralds were those who spoke and they declared messages on behalf of the king. That is what my responsibility is. To tell you what God has to say to you. God uses biblical preaching to reveal his will and to change lives. And that's why it's so important that we keep preaching as a priority here in this church. And in every church. Because out of the message that you hear comes the flow of ministry that will take place. Charles Spurgeon, again, identified as the Prince of Preachers, the great man of God, wrote this. He said, The Spirit of God bears no witness to Christless sermons. Leave Jesus out of your preaching and the Holy Spirit will never come upon you. Why should he? Has he not come on purpose that he may testify of Christ? Did not Jesus say, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you? Yes, the subject was Christ and nothing but Christ. And such is the teaching which the Spirit of God will own. Be it ours never to wander from this central point. May we determine to know nothing among men but Christ and his cross. Loved ones, we preach Christ so that if you're not a believer, you will believe. You will be persuaded to believe. If you are a believer, we still preach Christ because we want to persuade you to follow him, to yield to him, to surrender to him, to allow him to so impact your life that he becomes your all in all. So that you can obey him and love him and learn of him. And serve him for the rest of your life. He, he saved us. So that he could send us out into the world. Now there are people who are designated as pastors and teachers. Who will stand in the pulpit to preach. But loved ones make no mistake. You all can go out and preach the gospel. You can declare, you can go out and into your workplace and in your homes and in your neighborhood and you can be a herald for Christ. And you can put Christ on display not only by your words but by the way that you live. And let God use that to influence the world. Preaching is of the utmost importance. Let's pray. Father, your word has revealed to us that preaching has a, a vital role in the life of your church today. That you seek to declare a message through men and women and people who are fully and totally yielded to you. Father, may preaching continue to be a priority in this church and many churches across this land and in the world because it is through the means of preaching that you give out your message, your word and lives are changed use us to that end Lord and we'll give you thanks and praise for the work that only you can do of transforming lives and making us like your son the Lord Jesus Christ May that become a reality in the midst of our lives. For Jesus' sake, we pray these things. Amen. Well, friends, as you uh, have joined us on Facebook, I, I pray that God has spoken to you. The word of God has just gone forth. Maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't, uh, I trust that you will consider the claims of Christ he has revealed in his word that you are a sinner and that you are doomed to condemnation unless you look to him and you call out to him for mercy. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said in Romans, and you shall be saved. 
Acknowledge that you are a sinner and that you can't save yourself, but that Jesus Christ demonstrated his love for you and that while you, you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Believe on the Lord and be saved. And I hope you'll do that. For those of you that are watching and listening that know the Lord, be a mouthpiece for the Lord Jesus Christ. Preach Christ and Him crucified. When you do in the power of the Spirit, you will, you will see people's lives being affected. So I trust you would yield to that, obey his word, and let God make a difference in your life through the preaching of his word. So thanks for joining us this morning. We trust that, uh, that you will walk in faith and obedience, serve the king today, make his name great, and uh, Lord willing, we'll see you here again next week. God bless you. Goodbye.